I presume you're here in order to learn of Magecraft. I'll have you know, there's no room for the weak-willed in this course. And despite your best efforts, the sorcery of our time is but a fraction of what it once was in the Age of Gods. Much of the craft is established through pedigree, and the culture of mages is riddled with deception and moral depravity. That said, if you insist, I shall do my best to educate you in this miserable, yet fascinating world. In our previous lesson, I covered Kabbalah, which is quite likely the most popular thaumaturgical system mages use. Put bluntly, Magecraft is struggling in the modern era. Mystery, which serves as a foundation for our manipulation of mana, has been in steady decline ever since the Age of Gods came to an end. People no longer live according to their mythologies and superstitions. More accurately, the many diverse ways of thought and belief we once had are now streamlined by the clarity of science and technology. This means that Magecraft is a lot easier to perform if we rely on pre-established schools of thought that have better stood the test of time. We call these thaumaturgical systems, and while Kabbalah is a prominent one, there are many more systems I would like to focus on today. This includes major areas of study, as well as generalized motifs common among them. Given how prominent Kabbalah is to Magecraft, it makes perfect sense that both Christianity and the teachings of the Holy Church would count as their own school of thaumaturgy. In terms of practice, this includes the use of holy sacraments, as well as certain kinds of black magics. Let us not get lost in nuance. Members of the Church often practice magecraft, but due to conflict with the association, the Church prefers to call its methods sacraments, and even refer to mana as prayer power. As much as they want to separate themselves, they are indeed performing magecraft, just under a different name. A sacrament, then, refers to a tool or spell that is employed against heretics and other spiritual beings like demons and vampires. I'm certain by now you are all familiar with the Church's Black Keys, mana-infused swords that are manipulated and transformed to their user's will. They serve as the perfect counter against the immortality of dead apostles, lighting their victims on fire, pinning their shadows in place, and dealing incurable damage. Black keys are also used within baptism rites, incantations that exercise spirits. Witchcraft and the dark arts also have a long history with the Christian faith. Horrible ordeals like the Salem Witch Trials had both users of black magic and the innocently accused hunted and murdered by the fearful followers of God. Due to this, very few practitioners remain to this day, but there are some. While not witches, the Isakol family of mages are an old line of dark magic users who have been in decline since the Middle Ages. The family's heir, Selenik Isakol, joined the Yigid Millennia faction to preserve a sense of status, but lost her life through violent greed during the Great Holy Grail War in Trifas. Uniting both the Holy Church and Kabbalah is their mutual worship of angels. As a popular consensus, we think of angels as winged humans who share and spread God's wisdom. Their image harkens back to Nike, the goddess of victory, with many donning the garb and weapons of warriors. In terms of magecraft, angels are often a blanket term for beings of ambiguous magical nature, also described as vessels of power. As a generalized object of worship, mages care less about the religion they derive from, and more how angels can be used to stabilize magecraft in the modern era. In that regard, a mage hardly cares to discern angels from UFOs, so long as they can still be harnessed for spells. Western magecraft is especially interested in this, with angels being just as important as the elements to a mage. Rather, the two are indistinguishable. The lesser pentagram pairs each of the four archangels with one of the four elements, creating a symbol mages can use in rituals such as banishments. Earlier in this course, I brought up Adra, the Castle of Separation. While technically of a Kabbalistic nature, it makes use of a variety of angels described in Abrahamic faith, including those of the Apocrypha. To an ordinary citizen, statues of angels, wings, and halos hold more of a sentimental value. But to a mage, such worship brings about significant power. Astrology, or astromancy, is also tied to an angelic motif. 
Angels are associated with the constellations, and astrology is the pseudoscience of divining meaning from the arrangement of stars and planets in the night sky. Mages have been observing and predicting the stars since the ancient Chaldeans of the 10th century. As such, it occupies an entire department at the clock tower. This is carried on by mages such as Marisbury Animosphere and his daughter Olga Marie, who go on to establish the Chaldea Security Organization, which observes the entirety of human history like a planetarium mapping the stars. Olga carries with her a miniature Chaldeus that projects a model of the Earth's ley lines between symbols of the Greek zodiac. She can draw a magic circle to serve as her orbital plane, and by engraving zodiac signs onto stones, she can cast a variety of spells from blinding lights, barriers, and explosives. Her greatest spell comes from chanting stars, cosmos, gods, animus, antrum, unverse, anima, animosphere, to summon a meteor shower above her enemies. Her magic crest is located on her forehead, a representation of the planet Mars. Despite bearing the Animosphere crest, the bulk of the family's magecraft is passed on not just to Olga, but also Kirstaria Odim. Marisbury had taken the young boy on as his apprentice, teaching even stronger spells than those taught to Olga. Kirstaria learned of using astromancy to take control over the very planets themselves, using them to harness mana on a universal scale. It is an ideal magecraft even older than the Age of Gods that allows the user to turn the solar system into the largest magic circuit humanly possible. Such overwhelming power would bring the entire association to its knees, but because Kirstaria lives in the modern era, he can't actually put this technique into practice, making him solely a genius in theoretical magecraft. Only when Kirstaria finds himself in the distant past can he actually use his ultimate spell, Grand Order Anima Animosphere. It is the same concept employed by Olga, brought about on a colossal scale. He calls meteors to rain from the sky, with enough force to best the god Zeus and his thunderbolts. A less conventional use of astromancy is seen with the spellcaster Fluger. As an astrologer, he fights using a set of twelve knives, each engraved with a sign of the zodiac. While sharp, these knives are best used for fortune-telling, floating about him in an orbital pattern. In addition to predicting the future, he can channel the knives to alter that future in a limited space. One of the Animosphere branch families, the Fargo, practice astromancy according to the geocentric model, which assumes that the planets revolve around Earth instead of the Sun. The family's heir, Ernest Fargo, once tried to reach the root by breaking tradition and using the heliocentric model. He utilizes a connection between the human body and the planets in the solar system. In terms of magecraft, this means viewing the sun or heart as the center of the universe, instead of earth or the soul. Literally using his own body in a magical ritual, Ernest relied on necromancy to become an undead spirit, whose hair, bones, legs, soul, heart, head, chest, arms, and pelvis were scattered throughout his mansion in a strategic arrangement. Sadly for him, this ritual failed, in part due to his attempt to break free from family tradition. Even though everyone in the modern era knows that geocentrism isn't at all realistic, the legacy Ernest's family built up by worshipping it wound up having more potential than the actual scientific truth. Thus, rather than ascending Ernest to a state of genuine immortality, the ritual wakes his soul up as a monstrous ghost that tries to absorb the life of his own daughter. If not for that single blunder, he may have succeeded at becoming one with the cosmos. The twin towers of the Aselma family are also built around the idea of astrology. Its residents' daily activities are all meticulously planned to take advantage of the planet's position with the sun. This proves essential in their creation of their ultimate ambition, the princesses of gold and silver. As general as it sounds, it turns out that beauty is another common theme Magecraft is founded upon, and for the Aselma, a branch family of the Valuleta faction, Beauty serves as their means of reaching the root. Naturally, beauty can mean many things and is highly subjective. There's beauty from a mathematical sense with the golden ratio based off the Fibonacci sequence. Worship of its natural beauty can be traced back to Greek and Egyptian architecture. Then we have fashion, the sort of thing that is only considered beautiful by certain people at a given time. Things that are in fashion generally have more value than those that aren't. 
Some might consider religion a process of finding something beautiful and spreading that value among other people. When it comes to humans specifically, we often try to beautify ourselves through clothing and makeup. Conveniently, the earliest forms of cosmetics can be considered magecraft. Tens of thousands of years ago, people would decorate their skin to ward off insects, demons, or other spirits that could enter through their face. Some cosmetics, in contrast, were designed to invite spirits or gods. This became tied to beauty when the Egyptian princess Nefertiti used lapis lazuli as an eyeliner, despite it having toxic properties. Certain remarkable individuals, such as Cleopatra, Yang Guife, and Helen of Troy, are worshipped as exceptionally beautiful women, defining the beauty standards of their time. Hoping to channel the value of beauty, the Iselma family has spent generation after generation trying to create the most beautiful person, finally succeeding with their gold and silver princesses, designed from birth to simultaneously embody beauty in every sense of the word. Obviously, something like this is a contradiction, since some beauty standards contradict each other. This means that these princesses embody the very concept of beauty in a transcendent state, and it's through this transcendence that the root becomes attainable. It's based on logic that beauty is infectious. Looking upon something beautiful makes oneself more beautiful. Therefore, by gazing upon the ultimate beauty, a mage may be able to ascend themselves to a higher plane of being. This idea parallels the process of alchemy, where alchemists seek to turn fool's gold into actual gold. In our case, it's a process of trying to elevate a lowly human to a status more akin to a god. Speaking of alchemy, it too is another prominent thaumaturgical system. We've already spoken about its practical use with alchemists at the Atlas Academy, but we haven't done so based on its pseudo-scientific history before it evolved into the chemistry we use today. Alchemy is essentially the manipulation of matter, the flow through which one material becomes another. The Atlas Academy has its own history, but the alchemy most popular in the West, the kind adopted by the Clock Tower, is a product of the Middle Ages and the 16th century studies of Paracelsus von Hohenheim. He combined his knowledge of both magecraft and medicine in an attempt to save lives and improve the quality of life for future generations. By passing mana through different metals or elements, it was possible to reconfigure them into entirely new forms. We call this process transmutation, and it's deeply tied to jewel magecraft, which uses matter to store mana. In a similar fashion, Hohenheim invented the Philosopher's Stone, a crystal made up of condensed mana. These stones could be used as a catalyst for large spells, and even grant a shallow form of immortality. The good doctor was a brilliant philanthropist, but a terrible mage, if only for the fact that he wanted to share the fruits of his labor with the public. He believed his discoveries would help save humanity, to the point where he nearly mass-produced philosopher stones to disperse among the people, along with a formal publication of his studies. This goes without saying, but the Mages Association could not allow that, and Hohenheim was eventually executed in order to preserve the mystery of our craft. Unable to comprehend his selflessness, Mages eventually conjured his spirit through seance to hopefully gleam even more insight. However, there was no catch. Hohenheim simply wanted the best for children of the future, and he held no deeper secrets or ulterior motives. This established alchemy in the Western world, and for as harmful as it is to expose a mage's secrets, since doing so weakens mystery, the school of practice Hohenheim inspired has ultimately helped more than it's harmed, with alchemy being a solid thaumaturgical system that persists to this day. Hopefully, by now I've given you a glimpse of what thaumaturgical systems exist in the world and what they're capable of. You may have noticed that I've catered this topic toward mostly Western systems. That is not to say the East lacks its own foundation in magecraft. Far from it, which is why I aim to dedicate our next lesson to the various systems prolific to mages of the Far East. Only after covering thaumaturgical systems on a global scale can I truly conclude today's topic. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help us grow by liking, commenting, sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell so you don't miss out on all of our anime discussion, lore, or Let's Play content. You can support us directly through Patreon, Subscribestar, or our YouTube membership. 
all of which come with benefits like exclusive vids and early access. As always, celebrate, celebrate your, your fandom! fandom. I want to give a special shout out to all my $10 and up supporters. Video Gamer 75, Steven Elak, Samuel Gersten, Otaku Mom, Jens Bauman, Mystic Samurai 1983, Freebrick, Cosmonaut, RNG or Shuffles 1498, Alexis Yukio Gomez Yamato, Johnny Tsunami, Link Pendrago, Brandon Baker, Observer Bellis, Caitlin P, Vladimir Rovna, Succubus Sakura, Normace, Jonathan Padua, The Taz 96, and SF Giants fan Mike. Thank you all so much.